The story of Africa's post-colonial history is one that began with lofty dreams of freedom and prosperity for Africans, but this dream has largely not been realized. One prominent feature of the African story has been the many corrupt and unpatriotic leaders that Africans have been burdened with. Another equally well-known part of the story has been the few upright and patriotic leaders that Africa has been blessed with and how these leaders have been betrayed by those close to them. This very tragic aspect of the African story has led to some Africans concluding that these great leaders were betrayed by their own people and that somehow that is just how Africans are, that we always betray our great leaders who come to save us. For some, it must be something connected with our skin color. This video seeks to look into these long-standing beliefs using the story of the Congo's first prime minister, Patrice Lumumba, and Ghana's first president, Kwame Nkrumah. It is an undeniable fact that the removal from power of Patrice Lumumba and Kwame Nkrumah was largely orchestrated by Western governments led by the USA. But it is also a fact that these plans were carried out by Congolese and Ghanaian soldiers. This means that there was indeed a betrayal of two of Africa's greatest leaders by their compatriots. But can the actions of a few be used to condemn the majority? Is it fair or right to say that Lumumba and Kwame Nkrumah were betrayed by their people? Was the violent military coup to overthrow Kwame Nkrumah a popular one? Did the Ghanaian masses support or partake in the coup? And did the Congolese masses support the assassination of Patrice Lumumba? Or did they partake in the heinous act? Also, is it only in Africa that great leaders have been betrayed? It is the answers to these questions and more that this video seeks to provide. The story of how Kwame Nkrumah led Ghana to independence begins with him being invited to return to Ghana from the US to become the General Secretary of the United Gold Coast Convention, known in short as the UGCC. This invitation was sent to him by the leaders of the UGCC. The UGCC was a political party that was formed in the then Gold Coast and now Ghana with an aim of attaining independence from colonial rule. But within just 18 months of Nkrumah's return, he resigned from the UGCC to form a new party known as the Convention People's Party, CPP. Nkrumah made this decision because the leaders of the UGCC were not committed to achieving independence as soon as possible. They were content with moving slowly. This was in Nkrumah's words because they saw the liberation struggle as a movement to be conducted slowly and respectably by themselves, the professional and intellectual elite, and as having nothing to do with the toiling masses whom they regarded with a mixture of fear and scorn. As a result, the UGCC only called for self-government within the shortest possible time, compared to Nkrumah's CPP which demanded self-government now. This demand by the CPP resonated deeply with the Ghanaian people. And unlike the UGCC, the CPP was a party based on the support of the broad masses of the people and the youth. For his decision to break away from the UGCC to form the CPP, Kwame Nkrumah became intensely hated by the leaders of the UGCC. It was these elements who opposed Kwame Nkrumah all the way from his efforts to lead Ghana to independence through to his nine-year rule as Ghana's first independence leader. In his efforts to galvanize the Ghanaian people into forcing out the British colonizers, Nkrumah created a nonviolent campaign of non-cooperation known as Positive Action. This campaign involved strikes, boycotts, and press campaigns. Positive Action was the means by which we exerted political pressure for the achievement of our independence. For introducing the Positive Action campaign, Nkrumah was arrested and jailed for three years. But he spent just 14 months in jail as in February 1951, a general election was held in Ghana and Nkrumah's party, the CPP, won a sweeping victory. Nkrumah himself was elected as a member of the Legislative Assembly for Accra Central. The CPP won 34 out of the 38 elected seats in the Assembly. Kwame Nkrumah won the Accra Central seat with over 22,000 votes out of the 23,122 votes cast. The main opposition, the UGCC, fared very badly, winning only three seats and was disbanded following the elections. The election victory of the CPP meant that the colonial government had no choice but to release Kwame Nkrumah from jail. 
So in spite of the fact that Kwame Nkrumah was in prison and could not campaign in the run-up to the elections, he comfortably won his seat and his party won a resounding nationwide victory. This was how popular and beloved Kwame Nkrumah was amongst the people of Ghana. The colonial governor of the Gold Coast, Sir Charles Aden Clark, invited Nkrumah to form a government. And that is how Kwame Nkrumah became the leader of government business in 1951. Three years later in 1954, another general election was held and the CPP again won an overwhelming victory. Out of 104 seats in the Legislative Assembly, the CPP won 72 and the largest opposition party at the time won just 12 seats. The massive and undoubted popularity of the CPP and Kwame Nkrumah was cemented in the 1956 elections, which was the last general election before Ghana's independence in 1957. The CPP again won a decisive victory with a total of 71 seats in the Legislative Assembly. The opposition to Nkrumah had again rebranded themselves into the National Liberation Movement, but all this was to no avail. It should be abundantly clear at this point that the vast majority of Ghanaians had an unflinching loyalty towards Kwame Nkrumah and they also recognized his opposition for being the traitors they were. Again in 1960, a presidential election was held in Ghana and Kwame Nkrumah as expected won a resounding victory with over 89% of the votes. His opponent in this election was J.B. Dankwa who was one of the leaders of the UGCC. This was the third consecutive election that J.B. Dankwa, the opposition leader, had lost. In 1954 and 56, he lost in his own home constituency to the CPP candidate. If you did not already understand fully how unpopular Kwame Nkrumah's opposition was at the time, then I guess this should do the trick. Clearly, the opposition were no match for Kwame Nkrumah in a democratic contest and they knew this. This led them to resort to lies, violence and terrorism in order to eliminate Kwame Nkrumah. The opposition made six assassination attempts on the life of Nkrumah, with the most notable ones being the bombing at Kulungugu, where Nkrumah only narrowly escaped, and then the shooting at the Flagstaff house, where Sergeant Sally Fudagati took a bullet to save Nkrumah. Eventually, the opposition succeeded in their bid to remove Nkrumah from power through an alliance with traitors in the army and western governments. But was the coup that removed Nkrumah from power a popular coup? In other words, was the coup supported by the Ghanaian masses? Well, there was at least one demonstration to celebrate the coup. But is this sufficient grounds to say that Ghanaians were happy Kwame Nkrumah was removed from power? Before addressing the facts concerning this anti-Nkrumah demonstration, let us first look at how the coup plotters were able to get some Ghanaian soldiers to overthrow the legal government of Kwame Nkrumah. The soldiers were deceived by the plotters with a fake story that Nkrumah was planning to send them to fight in Vietnam and Rhodesia, and that Kwame Nkrumah had deserted Ghana and taken with him £8 million. Pounds. They were told that there was no government left in Ghana, and it was their duty to assume control of the country to maintain law and order. They were also told that Russian planes were landing on a secret airstrip in northern Ghana, and that for days Russians had been arriving. The soldiers were told that the only way to save Ghana and to avoid being sent to fight in Vietnam was to take the Flagstaff House. Several days after the military seized power, two of the traitors, Kotoka and Efifa, appeared on TV congratulating themselves on their easy success. They mocked the poor soldiers who believed their story and said, You know, we didn't find any Russians at all, not one. The attempt to seize power was not all plain sailing, however, as the traitors met very strong resistance from loyal soldiers who were defending the Flagstaff House. These patriotic soldiers refused to surrender and it was only after the traitors threatened to blow up the family residence at the Flagstaff House, in which Nkrumah's wife and their three young children were sheltering, that they finally gave in. In fact, a good number of patriotic Ghanaian soldiers who refused to join the traitors or surrender were murdered. The most popular one being Major General Bauer, Army Chief of Staff, who was in command of the Ghana Army at the time. He was murdered by the traitors, together with seven officers who were stationed at his house. General Bauer was shot dead by one of the traitors known as Kotoka, the one after whom Ghana's international airport in Accra is unfortunately named after. The patriotic soldiers were not the only ones who were killed by the traitors. Many innocent Ghanaians were also killed, including two members of parliament. A market woman who had a large picture of Kwame Nkrumah above her store was shot dead by a soldier after refusing three times to hand it over for destruction. 
In the days which followed the coup, hundreds of patriotic Ghanaians were thrown into prison. In fact, the entire leadership of the government and CPP, except for the few who managed to escape or go into hiding, were arrested and detained. So with all the violence, murders and arrests that the coup against Nkrumah entailed, it is no surprise that there was no immediate and open resistance to the traitors. In the two-way traffic of liberation, some are luckier than others. Many of Nkrumah's supporters got away. Others had no chance. Into the cells go the ex-Redeemer's ministers. With them, at gunpoint, go scores of MPs and officials of Nkrumah's Convention People's Party. Now back to the anti-Nkrumah demonstration that was much hyped by the Western media. One may wonder why some people will celebrate the overthrow of a visionary leader like Kwame Nkrumah. But we must understand and know that every leader, no matter how good or bad he is, will necessarily have opposition. In every society, there are bound to be those who oppose fairness, justice and equality. Those people will be unhappy if corruption, oppression and exploitation is being dealt with. Yes, the majority of the people will always love and support any leader who works to bring about social justice and equality. And this is exactly what the enduring and widespread support that Kwame Nkrumah and his CPP enjoyed amongst Ghanaians proved. Later on in this video, other similar instances about how progressive leaders from other parts of the world were also betrayed by a traitorous minority will be looked at. Immediately after the coup, the traitors released a few people who had been detained for political offenses. But because this number was so small, they also decided to release criminals who had been detained so as to promote a false narrative of Kwame Nkrumah as a dictator. These criminal detainees naturally led the anti-Nkrumah demonstrations, but they were joined by more sober Ghanaians. Here is how Nkrumah himself described those who celebrated his overthrow and their motivations. The intellectuals and professional classes had always been against my government, which they felt quite rightly, was challenging their position of privilege. The lawyer and the clergyman thus found themselves joining in the same processions through the streets as the criminal. There was a section of the market women who had been exploiting the shortage of goods due to the measures we had to take for the control of non-essential imports. They had been exposed by the Abraham Commission and they naturally were delighted that its chairman should have now been thrown in jail. In addition to this, there were at the start a number of people who were genuinely deceived by the revolt. The disastrous fall in the world price of cocoa had led to inevitable import shortages of consumer goods. These people really believed that the coup would change all this and so they joined the gangs in the streets. Others joined them out of curiosity. Even so, it was necessary for the army to force children from their school rooms and to dragoon demonstrators in order to make a satisfactory show. It should be noted that these anti incremental demonstrations happened in the capital city of Accra with no reports of any such demonstrations in other parts of Ghana. If it had been a truly popular coup, surely there would have been celebrations in other parts of Ghana. The great deception that the traitors had to engage in, coupled with the sheer violence and killings, showed that the February 1966 coup to depose Nkrumah was never a popular one. This fact is made much clearer in the events that happened after the coup, with Nkrumah in exile in Conakry, Guinea. Following the coup, the traitors set about destroying anything connected to Nkrumah. Books that were written by Nkrumah, pictures and artifacts that bore his name were all burnt and destroyed. Out of fear, the traitors banned pro-Nkrumah parties and candidates from contesting in the first election that was held after the coup. This showed that they were still aware of the love Ghanaians had for Nkrumah and his ideology. Despite being in exile, Kwame Nkrumah continued to cast a shadow over his enemies and they could not ignore him. In 1971, a good five years after Kwame Nkrumah had been overthrown, the traitors, specifically the Buzia government, forced through parliament a law that criminalized the use of any slogan, photograph or policy document of Kwame Nkrumah or the CPP. They saw that Ghanaians were increasingly clamoring for the return of Nkrumah and shamelessly passed that obnoxious law. In fact, Kwame Turi, the Pan-Africanist revolutionary who served under Nkrumah in Guinea, was convinced that had Nkrumah not fallen seriously ill and died, he would have been brought back to power by Ghanaians. And according to Professor Ajimandria, after the incompetent government of the traitor Buzia was deposed by nationalist soldiers in 1972, there was an attempt to bring Nkrumah back to Ghana. But he, he, he seemed to admire Nkrumah, his policies mirrored Nkrumah, so. and he literally went to beg Sekuture 
to give him Nkrumah's body. You are jumping the gun. When Nkrumah was sick, dying in Romania, mm -hmm. a champion sent Dr. Francis Nkrumah. The firstborn. Yes, to Bucharest. He paid for his trip there. Everything to bring back Nkrumah. Because, wow. Yes. Then Nkrumah said, unfortunately, his condition was such that the mm. doctors would not allow that mm. to happen. Mm. Then he made one request that if I die, please bury me in my hometown. In Crofo. Okay? In Crofo. Mm. So when he came to Guinea and died, a champion took that responsibility seriously. And you know the extent he went to bring Nkrumah's Which Ghana. is funny because we're talking about Guinea. Yeah. Guinea's president yeah. wasn't happy with Ghana because yes. he says we have mistreated Nkrumah. Of course. So Champo had to literally beg. Literally beg. Wow. Sending the uh, Gowan and uh, the Liberian president to plead. That he should give Nkrumah's body to It took about three months, yes. Before he agreed. Precisely. With enough focus having been placed on the traitors who sold out Ghana, it is important to also highlight those who stood by Nkrumah through it all even though it came at a great cost to them personally. After Nkrumah received the news of the coup as he arrived in China, virtually all of his aides displayed outstanding loyalty and freely agreed to follow him into exile in Conakry, Guinea. These aides had the freedom to return to their families in Ghana whenever they wanted, but they chose to stay with Nkrumah and serve him during his time in Conakry, Guinea. Here is one of these loyal men, Major Agbekuse Jafar, recounting the situation when they returned to Ghana years later. Interesting. How are you? How about yourself? <laughs> Where was your family when all of this was happening? When you were away for a long they time? They were away. And at the same time, too, uh, Osajifo would not allow uh, Fatia to come to Guinea because see the predicament of all of us. Mm. So we would not allow. But you know, apparently, when we came back, some of our wives got married to another people. Did, Did your wife get married? Did she remarry? <laughs> Let's see that one. <laughs> oh, come on. Oh, we, 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 now we're getting personal. We just want to know. I said some of our wives got married before yes. we came back. And, and <laughs> because you're talking about, about suffering. Upon the death of Osajifo Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, a state funeral was held for him in Conakry, Guinea. Hundreds of thousands of Guineans turned out to pay their last respect to the visionary and patriotic son of Africa. Over 57 years on from the day he was overthrown, Kwame Nkrumah remains undoubtedly the most respected and beloved Ghanaian president. Ghanaians today regularly salute him for his visionary works and for the fact that he did far more than any of his successes till this day. This is testament to the enduring popularity of Kwame Nkrumah amongst the Ghanaian masses then and now. As is well known by many who know the story about the brutal murder of Patrice Lumumba, Congolese leaders were key enablers of the Hinos Act. The Congo's presidents at the time, Kasavubu, Mobutu and Moise Chombe were all culpable in the assassination of Lumumba. Yes, Western intelligence agencies were deeply involved, but the fact remains that Lumumba's own compatriots cruelly enabled his brutal murder. But is this enough to say that the Congolese people betrayed Lumumba? In fact, can it be said in any way that the Congolese masses disliked Lumumba as Western governments and corrupt Congolese officials did? To answer these questions effectively, we have to go back to the period before Lumumba rose to power as the Congo's first Prime Minister. With the aim of attaining independence from Belgium in mind, Patrice Lumumba along with others formed the Congolese National Movement, known in short as MNC, in 1958. The MNC was a nationalist party that focused on national unity amongst all Congolese, regardless of ethnicity. As a result, the MNC led by Lumumba had substantial support from all parts of the Congo. This differentiated them from many other Congolese political parties that were based on ethnic or regional allegiances and so had limited support. Almost a year before the Congo's eventual independence, the Belgian colonialists were already worried and threatened by Lumumba and his growing influence. This was due to his huge popularity amongst the Congolese masses. On the 30th of October 1959, a congress was held by five Congolese nationalist parties. This included Lumumba's MNC. At the end of the congress, soldiers stormed in to arrest Lumumba. But the crowd that was present reacted so strongly to prevent the arrest of their leader, forcing the soldiers to abort the mission. This event led to the death of 30 Congolese and left over 100 others injured. This was how deeply Lumumba was loved by his people. 
Following this event, Lumumba was accused of inciting a disturbance and arrested on the 1st of November 1959. His arrest led to massive rioting in the Congo, and when King Baldwin of Belgium visited the Congo a month later, he was met by angry crowds who shouted, Free Lumumba! Patrice Lumumba was later freed in January 1960 after Congolese politicians who had been invited to Belgium for discussions ahead of their independence demanded his release from prison. For them, Lumumba was the most important voice in the struggle for independence and had to be present for their discussions in Belgium. This pressure forced the Belgian colonizers to release Lumumba and get him on a flight to Belgium. When Patrice Lumumba arrived at the airport, there was a huge crowd of at least 10,000 Congolese there to see him off. The first ever elections in the Congo to decide the leaders who would lead the African nation into independence was held in May 1960. There was a massive turnout of nearly 82%. MNC, the party of Patrice Lumumba, came out as the dominant force by winning the majority of seats. The rest of the seats were shared between more than seven political parties. So with many different options available on the ballot for the Congolese people, they still showed a clear preference for Patrice Lumumba and his nationalist party. This was only just a culmination of the love story that had begun long before the election, as Lumumba showed the Congolese masses that he genuinely represented their interests and the Congolese masses responded by placing their trust and hopes in him ahead of others. Despite all the demonization and sabotage campaigns, the Congolese people were still able to recognize that Patrice Lumumba was the one who best represented their interests and that of the Congo. Although Lumumba's MNC had won the majority of seats in the elections, the Belgian colonizers attempted to prevent Lumumba from forming a government by calling on others to do so. But this plan failed, forcing them to rightfully call on Lumumba to form his government for the Congo. The high levels of popularity and love Lumumba enjoyed amongst the Congolese people is why his enemies considered his elimination as the only effective way to get rid of him. They knew simply removing him from power was never going to be enough, as the Congolese people were going to resist this forcefully. Indeed, Lumumba's enemies were so scared of him that they at a point prevented him from communicating with the people, as they knew his strong bond with them was his greatest weapon. After Lumumba was brutally murdered along with fellow Congolese leaders, Joseph Okito and Morris Impolo, there was widespread anger amongst the Congolese people, with many threatening to retaliate with violence. This eruption of anger went beyond the Congo as protests broke out in many cities across the world. In the Serbian city of Belgrade, a mob stormed the Belgian embassy. A similar incident occurred in Cairo, where the protesters went a step further by setting the building on fire. The embassies of France and US together with the UN offices were not spared either. In Ghana, a large crowd invaded the US embassy and demonstrators denounced the UN Secretary General at the time together with the Congolese traitors. There were protests in many more cities such as Warsaw, New York, New Delhi, Havana, London and Shanghai. This only proves how deeply Patrice Lumumba was loved not just by the Congolese people but amongst the peoples of the world. As has been shown in this video, the popularity of both Kwame Nkrumah and Patrice Lumumba amongst their people was unquestionable. The plot to get rid of them was planned and carried out on the blind side of the masses by a small minority of selfish traitors. These selfish traitors hated and opposed the two great leaders because in their greed and selfishness, they could not stand leaders who were selfless and incorruptible. Leaders who were fully committed to advancing the best interests of their people. This was the main reason the opposition to Kwame Nkrumah and Lumumba hated them so much and wanted them gone by any means necessary. As has already been said, in every society, you would find these selfish and greedy individuals. People who wish to have all the power just to advance their selfish interests and have no care for the people. These traitorous elements have always opposed upright leaders who seek to ensure fairness and social justice. Elsewhere in Latin America, there are the stories of Chile Salvador Allende, Guatemala's Jacobo Abenz, Venezuela's Hugo Chavez and Bolivia's Evo Morales, amongst others. The stories of these leaders closely mirror that of Nkrumah and Lumumba. For seeking to advance the best interests of the masses, all of these leaders suffered military coups that were backed by the United States and carried out by traitors in their army. Also, all of these Latin American leaders, just like Kwame Nkrumah and Lumumba, enjoyed overwhelming support from their people. This proves two facts. 
One, that leaders who serve and protect the best interests of their people are loved and supported by the people. And two, that such leaders are always at risk of being removed by an alliance of Western governments and internal traitors. My motivation for putting together this video is to address the long-standing misconceptions about how Africans always betray their great leaders. This is false and hopefully this video has provided enough facts to prove that. The fact is that selfless leaders such as the two this video has focused on were greatly loved and fully supported by the masses. This was in fact what made them so powerful. Other great African leaders such as Guinea Sekuture, Malis Modibo Keita and Tanzania's Julius Nyerere were fully supported by an overwhelming majority of their people. The machinations of a tiny minority of traitors, a group that can be found in every society, cannot be used as a basis to condemn Africans as being traitors to their great leaders. Also, the many corrupt African leaders in history and presently make it look like Africans only choose to elect corrupt leaders. But history shows that whenever and wherever patriotic and selfless leaders have emerged, Africans have stood by them and supported them all the way. This was most certainly the case for Ghana's Kwame Nkrumah and the Congo's Patrice Lumumba, as this video has shown. In spite of all the demonization, lies and sabotage by the West and internal traitors, the African people always stood firmly behind their great leaders. This shows both the good and bad possibilities for when upright and selfless leaders emerge anywhere in Africa. Such leaders can be rest assured of the unflinching support of the masses if they can prove themselves. But they must also be on the lookout for inevitable attacks by traitors and their foreign sponsors. Please do support us by liking and sharing this video to others. And also please do subscribe to our channel for more videos. Thank you so much for watching.